I think um, it's been an interesting discussion and to some extent uh, a lot of the discussion has been family farms or corporate farms and uh, it's about capitalisation and where their money comes from and, and I think to some extent we ignore the fact that there's a lot more variation within each of those categories than there is between those categories. And I think the thing that really matters for most of them is about intellectual capital rather than the dollars. And it's intellectual capital, I think, that drives the difference that we see between farm performances. And I think it's interesting when you look at the asset management sector, if you like, the more corporate part of Australian agriculture where we see funds and institutional money coming in, I think we're actually seeing a transition in the asset managers. And so 10 years ago where the track record, I think, was, um, I'd say politely embarrassing, um, but patchy, depending on uh, your point of view, a lot of those asset managers actually came up as jackaroos, came through the traditional system, had a traditional view of agriculture. You look at now at the asset managers in agriculture, most of them are tertiary qualified, um, experience in agriculture or finance or some combination thereof. And I think we're actually seeing the skill level increase substantially in the asset management business. And I think that bodes very well for the future of, of if you like, corporate agriculture. I want to cover a, a few issues. I want to talk a little bit about performance. And, um, and I think this is it's still a very interesting story and we've got a lot to learn from it. I want to talk a bit about pros and cons of, if you like, the institutional or corporate end versus the family farm end. And, and quite a few of what I'm going to say really just reflects what others have said before and a few other bits and pieces that I want to throw into the mix. So the track record. Part of the issue we've got with, with corporates, and I talk more about institutional type investments rather than very large scale family farms, is it's not very transparent what their performance has been. And I think for a lot of them, the philosophy has been it's better to be thought of as a second rate manager than to be proven as one. And, and so a lot of the track record is not out there in the public domain. And, uh, and so what I've tried to do is look at returns for a number of corporate type agricultural operations. Uh, <coughs> this is uh, adding to some stuff I did for the Farm Institute a couple of years ago. And basically we've taken the first, or the performance per annum for an investment that started in the year 2000 or from commencement, whichever was earlier. And we've looked at total investor returns for those entities and expressed it as a per annum result. So you can see there we've got some pretty high highs. We've got a 45% per annum return for one. And we've got some pretty sad numbers there as well. As a general comment, and I'm not going to say who's who other than other than uh, growth farms is number six, where we're transparent about our operating return. We don't have long-term capital growth data at this stage, um, so it can't give a total investor return. But the ones that are giving the very high returns tend to be ones that are listed, not all the ones that are listed, but often, often their profits are capitalised up at high rates on the, on the share market. So they're, they're agricultural companies of some description that, have been, that are listed and uh, get an extra boost from having a high multiple in their performance. Generally down in the bottom half are the ones that invest in farms, operate or lease those farms, and they haven't exactly covered themselves in glory. And so to Barnaby's question this morning, why haven't institutions invested in agriculture? There's your answer. It's been often a pretty poor performance. We need to fix that. We need to get it turned around. And we need to offer competitive returns with those that investors can achieve in other sectors. And we need to be competitive with other sectors within agriculture. So we have some work to do. I think it is, uh, you know, we're, there's a range of reasons why some of those don't perform. And I'm happy to give you my opinion on that. And you can take it or leave it uh, as we go. 
I'll talk a little bit more about uh, growth farms track record simply because that's where I've got the best information and the question is how does it compare to family farms. So if we look at this, um, we've got uh, growth farms performance in the dark red and we've got ABARES average all broadacre index from operating return only. So we've done 4.1%, the average all broadacre index is 1.5% over the same period. You can argue that we have better scale, so we're managing farms that on average are capitalised with uh, $12 million, so maybe we've got a scale advantage which is, which is giving us some of that. If we look at our track record compared to the top quartile of uh, the broadacre index, we're about on par over that period. <clears throat> I actually think that's quite reasonable because the broadacre index actually has good farms coming and going from it over any one period. So the repeatability of performance of top quartile farms is not actually that high. So you're actually measuring different farms in different years because they come and go from being within the top quartile. So I don't think there's any doubt that that uh, you can compete with the returns from family farms. We can outdo the returns from the bottom end of the sector because we know there are so many laggards and it's relatively easy to outcompete them. If you compare to the top group, we think we can achieve comparable operating returns as those. I think um, the question about what drives performance, and I think there's really two things that drive performance. You've got to buy well and you've got to manage well. You stuff up either of those, you stuff up the returns. So you go in and you pay 20 to 30% over the market, basically there you go. You've, you've done your capital growth for the next five years, maybe longer, something like that. But not only that, you've depressed your return on capital during that period. So fundamental is to buy well. And I think institutions or asset managers on behalf of institutions or endowments often struggle to do this. And it's one of the disadvantages they suffer is that you're given a bucket of money, say $100 million, and they say go to it, invest it over two years. What you haven't invested at the end of two years will take back. So there's a strong imperative of the asset manager to get the money spent. And that may mean that it's spent on assets that are overpriced or not good enough quality. And so it's a real issue to try and meet the objectives of these institutional investors with large check sizes who want the money invested over relatively short time frames. One way people do it is to go and buy large scale farms, go and buy 50 million, 100 million dollar farms or aggregations. And that in itself brings particular issues because there are very few aggregations that you look at that you'd want to own the whole lot. And quite likely you would want to own some of the assets which are high quality, but often you've got some rubbish in there as well. Often those larger scale assets get pushed by the market because there's other people chasing uh, opportunities to deploy big chunks of capital. And so they tend to get overpriced. So you, you've got a number of issues trying to deploy the capital well. But at the end of the day, if you don't buy well, you might as well not start. You'll be behind it from the eight ball. So I think the challenge for larger scale investors is, is having that ability, the flexibility to buy well. One of their advantages is you, if you've got the right mandate from the investor, is you can invest on a, on a range of sectors in a range of geographies. So it becomes easier to deploy the capital. So if you can put some in sugar in Northern Australia and some in wheat in Western Australia, you get a lot more buying opportunities than if someone says you're gonna put it all into, into uh, nuts in Mildura, where obviously you're gonna push asset prices. The second part is managing well. And, and fundamentally, you know, I think there's been a lot of uh, ideas that really don't focus on what matters at farm level. And essentially, if we look at most Australian agricultural businesses, they're in the commodity business. What's the key thing to get right in, your commodity, in a commodity business is to be the lowest cost producer. Sustainably, obviously, and over the long term. So the reason BHP and Rio can, and continue to survive 
and make profits apart from their write downs and other things, but they're making cash surpluses is because they're low cost producers. They're at the bottom end of the cost curve. And it's a concept that I think we ought to talk more about in agriculture. We need producers to focus on getting down the bottom end of the cost curve. So they're producing beef at the, at the lowest cost per kilo or the lowest cost per tonne of wheat. And that is much, much more important than getting the premium price. And, and so often we see these ideas, and I think David talked about it, where people go in and they're going to go up the supply chain, they're going to command a premium, they're going to capture the value, and they're going to open a chain of, a chain of butcher shops through Asia or whatever they're going to do, and they just blow it. Their expertise is in managing farms, and when you start trying to capture that premium off farm, downstream, it's a completely different business to be in. And, and so the focus has got to be on being low cost, efficient producers. So it's not about being the cheapest in terms of having the lowest absolute cost, it's about the lowest cost per unit, per tonne or per kilo or whatever you're producing. So managing well is fundamental to it, but it's relatively simple if you get three or four things right. The problem is, I think in agriculture, we tend not to understand the key drivers broadly, particularly in the livestock sector. We tend to get muddled about what matters and what doesn't matter. And as a consequence, we make poor decisions about what drives profitability. So if we look at the pros and cons, and I started off with this slide putting some in red because I thought they were disadvantages and some left as they were. But the reality is they, they're the pro, there can be a plus in one scenario and a minus in another scenario. So I left them all the same colour. But the corporates obviously have got buckets of capital. So that helps them sort of capitalise the business properly from the start. Not necessarily to buy the biggest, but to get the business properly, properly capitalised. So if you buy it for 5 million or 10 million and it needs 2 million of capex on it, it's all clear up front and done. So you've got access to the capital. The corporates can move. Family farms, they tend to be based in a, in a community, in a regional area. And, and if they want to expand, they'll tend to want to do it within a reasonable distance unless they're prepared to say, I'm going to the other end of the country. And that's more unusual than usual. So, so the corporates have an advantage in that they can see value in Western Australia at the moment or value in northern beef. That'd be surprising, wouldn't it? Um, but maybe it's there. Um, so, so they can move the resources to where the opportunities are. It's much harder for a family farm to do that. And, and the corporates have to be very conscious that their mandates give them flexibility to achieve that, rather than locking them into a strategy for the next three years where the market may move. The corporates should have some rigour around their analysis, but as Dave Cornish says, you can't farm on an Excel spreadsheet. So I think the rigour is about what goes into the spreadsheet and, and making sure that things like um, major increases in commodity prices aren't factored in to drive the returns. If you can't achieve the returns on, say, five-year historical median prices, don't even start. Getting price rises through the life of the investment because Asians want to eat more beef is great, but if that's factored into your analysis, then I think you're high risk before you even start. Yeah, you know, the corporates should have expertise, and they do have access to expertise, but it's about how you use that expertise. They've also got constraints, and I've talked about those things. You've got costs that come on top of things, which I'll talk a bit more in a minute. They've got scale advantages, but scale advantages, I think, are overplayed in agriculture. There's certainly benefits of being having a farm capitalised at, say, 8 or 10 million, compared to a farm at 2 million, but is 20 mil better than 8 mil? Is 50 mil better than 8 mil? And it's not. There's actually evidence of diseconomies of scale. And so the reason asset managers or corporates chase scale is for their own benefit, not for the benefit of the, of the operating scale of the business itself. It's about managing asset or funds under management. So the family farm you know, has some on the other side of the coin. They tend to be capital constrained, so they can only make maybe two or four acquisitions in their lifetime without tipping the business over, or taking the risk of tipping the business over. 
they tend to focus more locally, but they've got very good, very high level of local knowledge. So there are things that are in favour of some and against others. Managing well, I think um, you know, one of the disadvantages that corporates have is the compliance and the overheads. So to set the structures up, you're writing out big checks to fat lawyers in fancy offices with great views of the harbour. It adds nothing to the returns at the farm level. Uh, but you've got to do it. You've got no choice but to do that. So you've got a lot more compliance. And, and the question is, does, does the advantages that a corporate offer in the scale and their flexibility and maybe their ability to, to invest over a wide, wider region more than compensate you for those additional costs? Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Family farms are flat, lean, patient capital, can be 20 year, 50 year investment timeframes. Some corporates can do that, others are there for seven or 10 years. And if you're there for seven years, if you've been there for the last seven years, you've probably got no land appreciation apart from in the last six months because it's been flat. So you've been unfortunate if you went in seven years ago. So there's a mixture of pros and cons, and I don't think one should automatically assume that one is better than the other. It is about the intellectual capital that is brought to bear on the business to get it right and overcome the disadvantages and play to the advantages that each one offers. So just briefly, in terms of other thoughts, you know, talking to a range of investors, you know, Australia is of increasing interest. And, and there are a number of reasons for that, a number of which are out of our control. The first two matter probably more than most. Our dollar is low, so farms are 30% cheaper than they were two years ago if you're in the US or in Europe. The US land prices have peaked and look like they're tipping over, so investors are saying, well, North America is not so attractive anymore. We've got good rule of law, low subsidies, all those things. We've got incredibly diverse opportunities in Australia to invest. You can go to tropical agriculture, to temperate, permanent crops, whole range of things. We do, though, have to be globally competitive. And uh, we have to be globally competitive as producers, but also our structures. So stupid ideas of 1% FERB on investment coming into Australia do not help our global competitiveness. Likewise, 5.5% stamp duty. You know, so investors only end up with 94 cents for every dollar they put in before they've even started. I think increasingly investors are becoming more sophisticated. So you hear some of the conversation earlier about we'll go slowly, we'll learn, rather than jumping on board and going in wholesale uh, with limited expertise. We're seeing a combination of lease and operate models. And I don't think there's one that's necessarily better than the other. It is part of what the the investors want. They've got a whole heap of criteria that you've got to meet and sometimes they think, why don't you just operate this because it'll give you the best returns over long term, but there are a whole heap of, of other reasons that matter. And lastly, Australia is increasingly seen as part of a global portfolio. So we see investors saying, I want to do this in Australia because we know that you're good at doing that. And we say, but what about concentrating it all in one sector or two sectors? Say, doesn't matter, we've got some in North America, we're in South America, we're in New Zealand. So it's part of their big picture and Australia fits into that. So I've got to wrap it up, but I guess the key thing is that it's not one or the other. One is not automatically better than the other. I think it is about how well we bring intellectual capital to bear on the capital that we have available that makes the difference to the performance of the farms. Thank you.